Hello and welcome to Serial Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Anna Flockett, editor of Startups Magazine, and we're an online and print publication dedicated to championing tech startups and entrepreneurs. Today I'm with my lovely panel and we're going to be talking all about female founders in honour of International Women's Day. Panel, welcome. I'm going to go around and ask you to tell me a little bit all about yourself and the one key inspiring moment on your journey in becoming a female founder. Melissa. Hi everyone, um, yeah, my name is Melissa Wills, I'm the founder of Women Like Me, um, so we're a community organisation and basically I started it to uplift, support and celebrate women from underrepresented backgrounds that work in technology, specifically from black and Asian communities. Um, and being a woman in tech myself, um, it's just what I love doing. I've got so many inspiring moments to pick from. Um, if I had to pick one, it probably would be um, doing my Drivers for Change journey. Um, and that is really the catalyst that helped me start Women Like Me, because I got a chance to get out of London and explore different social businesses and enterprises. And it really just like let me like make my mind up about women like me and just push me to start it, basically. So, oh, wow. yeah. Amazing. One program at many moments within that. So. So I'm Lara, I run Found and Flourish, which is a female founders network, media and events business. And I would probably, there are so many moments that I could talk about, like Melissa says, you know, there's, there's it's difficult to pick one, um, but I think being able to meet such wonderful and inspirational women working on incredibly um, uh, inspiring businesses that are, are set to change the world and have a positive impact on society. That, that for me is amazing and being able to meet women who have come to events and been a part of the community and to hear their feedback saying that it's being part of the community that's inspired them or empowered them to build these businesses is just wonderful. So I'd probably say that, yeah. I'm Suzanne, I'm the founder of an online tech platform, uh, roomlab.co.uk, which is an online interior design platform, which in kind of human speak means that we match um, homeowners and property developers, people that have show homes with um, incredible interior designers that have been in like El Deco, et cetera, who want to work from home in an accessible way to work with people that need great design and we make it fun, creative, affordable, all through our tech platform. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what we're working on at the moment. Well, it's clear to see we have some amazing women in business here today. Um, at Startups Magazine, we like to focus on the tech startups and we were recently um, appalled to see one of the stats was actually um, only 3% of females say a career in technology is their first choice. Panel, how, did, how do you feel about this and what can we do to change this? Yeah, I mean, I would like to say that I'm shocked, but I'm, I'm not. <laughs> um, and that's one of the reasons why I started Women Like Me, because working in tech is possible. Um, I don't really want to outright blame the industry, but I think even just outside of that, the workplace is a reflection of what goes on um, in our everyday lives. And I think um, socialisation is just a big factor in, in what women choose to do and what women choose to go to work in. Um, I think if we just spent more time like within our families, amongst friends encouraging each other to um, look for different routes into tech, then we could solve the issue. And even just with initiatives that we've started um, as women as well, we can really boost um, the amount of women that are interested in tech. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, yeah. I think also, I guess, changing the narrative around tech um, we were talking about this the earlier, language. yeah, the language, um, you know, I think it also starts at schools because it's it's at that part of your, the journey where you start, um, I guess, creating this idea of what it is you want to do with your life and how you want to, um, you know, make a career for yourself. And if it's targeted predominantly at young boys, you know, it's around tech, gaming, um, a lot of gambling tech companies, um, young girls are just not necessarily going to be that attracted to that route. So I think changing the narrative and the language around tech at a young age from schools is really key. And I think we're starting to see that as people, yeah. as um, organisations and schools are starting to encourage things like kids learning how to code at quite a young age. Um, we are moving in the right direction, but it's, it's taking a lot of time. Yeah. And do you see many um, female founders in your network that are 
coming up with tech and have tech businesses and is it on the rise? It's definitely on the rise, yes. And I think with wonderful uh, networks and communities like Women Like Me and Found and Flourish, you know, a couple of years ago when I set up the business, I really struggled to find a network and a community for women that I could relate to. But now, two years later, we are so lucky to have an abundance of yeah, opportunities and options out there. And I think it really now is just actually picking one that speaks to you on a personal level. Um, so yeah, I, I do have hope for it, but I think a lot still needs to be done to close that gap. I've, well, I've actually got what is called a tech business. I, am, I have that label, tech founder, uh, but I don't actually know much about tech. I'm not a coder. I wouldn't have ever thought when I was at school that that was going to be my career progression. I chose something very creative um, in the interior design industry and have now moved into being a tech founder by using technology to enable uh, interior design to become more accessible to everybody. So I think... Uh, I think if someone had told me when I was younger, oh, you know, would you like a career in technology? I would have said absolutely no way. And I would have been in one of those 3%. Because amazing. it was a very kind of male, cold, scary, scientific, mathematical world that I just thought wasn't for me. I perhaps didn't really understand it. So I think the language, like you said, the narrative, it all needs to be shook up. The look of what technology is. And we need to really understand that technology isn't something scary and masculine and unaccessible. It's something it's that enabler. we're all using. It's an yeah. enabler. And yeah. it's it's making everybody's lives actually a little bit better. Yes. Like, you know, through companies like Airbnb, through companies like Uber, you know, as controversial as they can sometimes be, it's actually moving the world making forward. Life so much easier. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a progression. Yeah. Um, Technology is the future, of course. <laughs> um, brilliant. Well, thank you, panel. Um, now it's time for Find the Lie section. So I have given our lovely panel each a statement and I'm going to ask them one by one to read out their statement. And then as a group, we're going to decide which one is the lie. And then I'll tell them whether they were right or wrong. So Suzanne, shall we start with you? Sure. Oh, it's like a fortune cookie. <laughs> Triple the number of men have had a career in technology suggested to them as opposed to women. So triple the number of men have had a career in technology suggested to them as opposed to women. Mm. Which builds on what we were just saying a minute ago. Yeah, really. mm. I could believe that. Yeah, I'd say it's true. I'd say true as well. Yeah. Well, should we read the others? Yeah. Mm. Lara, yours? What's this one say? A million women need to be hired by the UK's tech industry to reach gen gender parity. Um, I'm not very good with numbers, but I could probably believe that. I would have thought more. I would have said more as well. Yeah, mm. I think more based on the, the the gender gap within tech yeah. and the number of people in this country. And, and just the workforce. Quick math. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Melissa, would you like to read yours? Mm -hmm. That's just just okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, here we go. <laughs> Maybe later. I'll just <laughs> right. Um, so the majority of women from our readership survey have experienced prejudice or their entrepreneurial entrepreneurial journey. Sorry. Yes. Startups so magazine did a readership survey of everyone that reads our magazine, and we asked everyone, and the majority of women who responded mm -hmm. said that they had experienced prejudice on their journey as a female um. in tech in the startup industry. Um, okay, I read that a bit wrong, yeah. but um, yeah, no, that's fine. 100% I would say that's true. Um, okay. Even just going off from what I learned as a tech journalist, um, just interviewing women in that space, yeah, definitely. Okay, so oh, now you've heard all three, <coughs> do you have any ideas which one you're still thinking? So oh, yeah, I've got is it that okay. one is false and the rest are true? One is false. Oh, interesting. Ah. I, I'm i inclined to say that this is false and actually the number is higher. Okay. So I, I reckon we need more women um, than more a million than to be hired in by the UK's tech industry to reach gender parity. Okay. I don't know, what do you guys wow. reckon? It's definitely not Melissa's one, because I would say not only, I'd say every woman has experienced some prejudice. At some point, yeah. So I, I really don't think it's that one. Um, I mean, yeah. it's a tricky one. You could be trying to kind of 
lead us slightly yeah, because yeah. triple yeah. the number of men have had a career in technology suggested. It could it could well be double, but mm. I think there's no getting away from the fact it's, it's going to be more. Um, Mm. And with this one, I mean, just going back to like social research methods and things like that, I think women are more likely to admit that they've, you know, suffered from prejudice. Yeah. So, in a survey. Yeah. So this perhaps. Yeah. So which one are we going for, ladies? Sorry. Uh, no, yeah, no. Like, yeah. Mm, I'll go uh, with Lara's. I reckon. I reckon. Lara's. Lara's. That's, yeah. 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 I can tell you, you were wrong. Oh, okay. Okay, which one was it? Suzanne, you hit the nail on the head. Oh, Yours yeah. was false and it was double, not oh, triple. No oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So like you say, there's obviously still a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. It's still not a positive, but mm. yes, it's only double, oh, not that's triple. Interesting. Yes. All right, so we do, we I'd do say only need a million, need a million women, 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 but okay. Yes. No, that's that's good to know. Yeah. Hmm. So okay. you're all right, well done. In a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now it is time for our serious Sally moments. <laughs> Can you see of Sally Webster. Brilliant. So, um, as much as we obviously like to have a chat and talk about these things, um, my serious question to you is, is do you see the modern business world as being inclusive of people, both men and women, who want to start a family? Laura, you have a child. How, how do yeah, you? Yeah, well, about we this? were talking about this earlier, weren't we? Because um, Suzanne and I both have um, a child, and um, shared a lot of photos. Shared a lot of photos. Yeah, <laughs> We've done that all day. Um, <laughs> I think the easiest answer is no. I don't think the industry is set up in a way at the moment that supports both men and women wanting to start a family. Um, it's also really hard to pinpoint whose responsibility it is. I think it, there's multiple roles and responsibilities shared here when it comes to owning the fact that it's not um, designed to support people who want to have families. So that could be down to flexible working, that could be down to um, men not actually having the same uh, parental leave as women. Um, the government unfortunately not funding things like childcare or as much as they could. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? You, you've experienced it, haven't you? Yeah, I think it's. I, I think it comes across multiple levels. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I think it's difficult. Difficult for men and women actually in fairly equal amounts. Um, and there's things that could be done to improve it, like they're doing out in the Scandies, for example. Yeah through high taxes, but then through better support, not only whilst you've got a young child, but whilst you're pregnant, while you're on maternity or paternity leave, um, better understanding in the workplace of the need for flexible working. Mm. And, but very much along the lines of what you touched on is there's just not enough um, support in terms of funding for childcare. So you can have a, you can go through all those hurdles of pregnancy, early ch you know newborns, etc., and then go back to your career, which in itself could be a bit of a struggle, and then you're faced with perhaps an unsupportive boss or workforce and having to pay for childcare. So mm. all of our wages now cover our childcare for both Laura and myself, which you know we're happy to do because we're running our own businesses and it's something that we're excited and passionate about but if you're with an employer that isn't that way be you male or female I think that would be that that would be a challenge mm -hmm. and you're you're left with not feeling like you're doing either particularly well be it a parent or in a working environment and a lot of guilt so oh we God. need to we need to move forward but it goes back to this narrative thing and how you know as soon as the awareness is kind of half the journey if we're aware of it then we'll will start to change it over time, hopefully. Yeah. What the solution is, I don't know. <laughs> That's it. There isn't one solution. But you have wonderful people like Anna Whitehouse, um, Mother Pucker, who's championing Flex Appeal, um, for, so flexible working, and so many wonderful women and campaigners mm -hmm. and you know organisations really kind of trying to change that narrative in the public domain so that at policy level things are changing within the government. But the problem is there aren't enough women rep like there aren't enough women representing us in um, you know, uh, government. So it's taking a lot longer for that narrative to change and for people to listen, because unfortunately the people at that level aren't necessarily experiencing what a lot of us are experiencing. But 
Yeah, 100%. Um, it is interesting if we're talking about solutions and innovation. I think it will actually take a woman in a leadership role to push the boat out a little bit and just be like, yeah, okay, hey, I'm bringing my child to work today, even though it's a nine to five. Let's see how I get on. Because I know we were discussing it earlier. Yeah, bring a pet in, yeah, bring yeah. a baby, which is very different. Yeah, I no, like, exactly. I like your thinking. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just the level of responsibility and care yeah. that it would take. And I know there's, you know, a phrase it takes a village to raise a child. So mm. we have to get used to different Maybe people being normal. around. Yeah, normalize let's it, normalise yeah. it. And it just takes yeah. that one person to, mm. to make a difference, really. Yeah. Um, and I think it would get support to whoever tries it. Yeah, um, and I think... Cuckoo's Nest, so there's a creche that you can go to on site. It's like a work, a co-working space with a creche. So I think more kind of creche, uh, uh, like creche yeah, creche gift. yeah, and and maybe and maybe with more government gift. funding from from that, you know, maybe we can actually see women being and men being able oh, to bring their yeah, kids into the workplace. My husband would love that. Yeah, <laughs> I would too. Yeah. <laughs> I think they miss them. Mm, they do. I think yeah. the men miss their children. Like they, mm. they don't, they don't want to work those crazy hours. But in a way, they don't have the leverage either to be mm. like, oh, I'm the, I'm the woman. I've got to leave. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I think sometimes it's actually harder for them. That's why it's also really important that this discussion continues to be had because. I don't have arguments, but I have conflicted conversations with my husband who says, you know, oh, but it's difficult for me to say I need to leave because I need to go and do nursery pickup. And I said, why? Why shouldn't we be sharing the load 50-50? Why, why can you not for half the week, you know, be able to leave early because the other half I'm doing it? Yes, I'm running my business and he's working for a, a tech company, but, you know, the narrative needs to change so yeah. that we go, actually, yeah, the, the responsibility should be split 50-50 because yeah. yeah. right now they're not and the carer and the parental responsibilities do land on mm. the women. And on the flip side, sorry, just to add, like imagine like what your children would soak up just being yeah. around you, yeah. like our mum in the workplace, a founder, you know, doing her thing and just subconscious, subconsciously at yeah, a young yeah, yeah. age. And being I around their dad at work as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. It, it would be brilliant. Yeah. Well, I was just going to add to that. You said, obviously, you're running your business. Is it harder running your own business as a founder, having a child, than it is working for someone else in, in, a, in a business? Or is it easier? Or is it... I think about this a lot, actually. Mm. Because ha having your own business, obviously, you've got flexibility. You, you can take extra days holiday and, you know, you can, you can get there at 10 a.m. and things. And you've got no one kind of to report into. But then you never get the switch off. Ever. So at the weekends, in the evenings, you put them to bed, you never have that kind of holidays. It's always there. The buck always stops at you. Um, I wouldn't personally have it any other way. Mm. Um, That's when it comes back to passion. Mm. Yeah, like, you, like you were saying, um, working for another business and then your salary going towards childcare is so much, it's such a, a tough pill to swallow compared to us running a business and doing something that we're truly passionate about and, and believe is making mm. a difference. Yeah. Because at least then we're building on something that we're creating it's and bigger. that we're passionate about and that's mm. bigger than us. In, yeah. um, I think so, it's like, it, it's, it's really hard to measure. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, you can't switch off. You don't switch off. I haven't mm -hmm. had a holiday in two years. I've been away, but I've been yeah. <laughs> I've been online oh, every yeah, day. And, and the guilt you feel when you're with your child. And also, I was thinking the other day, my husband was at work. I, I have um, two days a week where I'm with my son. I had to get this email out the door. And he said to me, Dada, Dada, where's Dada? And I was like, well, Daddy has to work today. And I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm sat here um, feeling guilty because I have to send an email and I'm with my child. But my husband doesn't feel guilty going to work and sitting in an office and he's no. not with him. So it's kind of like that, it's that change of mentality as well oh, to think yeah. it's okay that you're juggling and you're trying to do more than one thing and not to beat yourself up when you have to send an email and you're looking after your you child. You always feel guilty and you should Yeah, have. it's always a compromise when you're running your own business and looking after oh. kids. I don't feel guilty when I leave the house to go to the office, no. but I feel guilty if I'm working at home and when she's around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of food for thought there, ladies. <laughs> so it's now it's time for our <laughs> air horn moment. So we we found that seventy eight percent eight percent of students cannot name a female in technology. Shocking. Can you? That is my question. Suzanne, I think we're exposed to it, so we know people within our kind of peer group or above us um, who are in the you know in the same industry. 
and then we probably read quite a few business books or we were exposed to it. So people for me like Sheryl Sandberg, who, you know, was her, her leaning book very highly publicised and it was kind of out in the population on the tube, people were reading it. But when I had a look at what we we're going to discuss today, I realised that this was one of the questions. I actually Googled um, like female tech founders, which I know is a bit different to women in tech, but the top 10 that came up, I was kind of ashamed to say that I didn't recognise any of their names. Mm, they're oh, American? Wow. Yeah, they're, I, well, I presume so. I mean, mm. I like to think so, because if they're in the UK, I'd like to think I had you a bit more awareness. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I didn't recognise their names. It's mm. just kind of, it's, it's not out there, really. You know, you're, you're more likely to know female fashion designer, for example, True. or Charlotte Getting Tilbury with makeup and things, but mm. you don't really know them in the tech, the tech sphere. Well, maybe That's someone really will be watching this and then when they ask that question, <laughs> they can name one of you ladies. That would be oh, nice. That's yeah. nice. Laura, yeah, I think, I think for me, um, there's quite a few women within the community that are building things at the moment. Like I have a good friend called Tamarin Stowell who is creating a, a, a tech app uh, for social impact called SoCo. Um, and that's definitely going to be one to watch in the next couple of years. She's just uh, raised funding, so I'm really excited for her on that. I think a woman in tech who I've always um, been incredibly inspired by is Sharma Dean Reed, who um, owns Beauty Stack, which is a beauty uh, tech platform. It's an app. Um, she started off as a nail beautician, <coughs> ran Wa Nails, and soon started to realise that having listened to all her customers, there were some problems that she could provide solutions for. So she actually sold her house to be able to pay developers to build this technology platform that she had as an idea. And she put everything she owned into this. And she's incredibly inspirational. And oh. it, I think it's really paying off because she's got a great team. She's internationally recognized now. Um, she's young, she's um, a single mum. She co-parents, but yeah, she's just an, a, a huge and she inspiration. she listens to what our customers want. And she listens to what our customers want, which is something that I was talking about yesterday mm. on IGTV. It's so important, because if you don't listen, you it's don't... It's hard to hear that sometimes. Yeah. 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 Good for her. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Feedback is gold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Melissa, obviously, I'm sure you can name many, but... Yeah, uh, I, I mean, just because of... Of this, I'll name some tech founders that are in my community. Um, so we've got Hannah Hussein and Tilly Harris, um, yeah. who I'm quite close to. So Hannah Hussein has a tech platform basically that helps um, PR. One well, no, that helps businesses with their PR. Yeah. Basically, it's quite disruptive. I won't go into detail because it hasn't launched yet. Okay. But that's yeah coming up. One to watch. watch <laughs> yeah, one to watch, and there's another one to watch um, by Tilly Harris called A Coup. Um, and that is a community platform, which I think you'll like. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, and she's basically um, not, she's not being like, you know, slack and doing like, you know, let's communicate, type, yeah, yeah, and communicate. It's more of a, okay, let's really understand like the deep implications mm -hmm. of what our relationships are to each other. Yeah, I um, and that. Yeah. Did you say, do you know if you said the name of it? Aku. Aku. Yeah, A-K-O-U. A coup. Yeah, okay, a coup. that sounds brilliant. Another one to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Another one to watch. Nice. Oh, yeah. wow. Getting on there as soon as that can yeah. launch. So. Oh, very good. Yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, hopefully this uh, stat can name some more and we can change that as well. Mm. Well, finally, panel, I wanted to ask mm. you to maybe end on a bit more positive. If you could change one thing in the current business landscape to encourage more women to start their own businesses, what would it be? Who change, one thing. Yeah. <coughs> change one thing that's out there to encourage more females to create their own startups, start their own business. What would you change, Melissa? Oh no, okay, I thought you were going to go right. Okay, um, <laughs> what would I change? Uh, do you know what? I think to start your own business, you really do have to put yourself out there. Um, mm. I think we can all relate to that um, and it's just taking that moment to do it and I think a lot of people, women especially don't get a chance to have that moment and especially if they do have children as well so I'd, I'd want to design a safe space where people can do that I know there are a lot of like pre-accelerator programs um, but I'd, I'd want to do something more intimate okay. for women mm, um, great. yeah yeah I'll, I'll just stop there perfect <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'd gone sorry <laughs> I'd, ag I'd agree with that actually because I think it. I think it goes all the way back to confidence building mm. and feeling like you can do something. Because 
if you don't feel that, you're up against so many obstacles, and including your own mind, you know, yeah. whether they be real or not. Um, I was really fortunate that I went out there and asked for people's opinions from women that were already, I kind of thought, right, I've got this idea, who do I know that's in tech? And uh, one woman in particular, uh, Jess Butcher, who I knew from um, I knew from my school days. She founded Blippa, which is like a, oh, yeah. a unicorn, and she's very, you know, she's done extremely well. And I went and spoke. I thought, who who can I speak to? And I went to speak to her, and she said, you know, she listened to my whole idea for half an hour before she gave me her honest feedback, and then she supported me in those early days and Amazing. gave me the confidence to believe that it was possible. Mm. And, um, you know, she, she told me what I needed to improve in things, but I did have that kind of mentoring element where I felt that I could ask someone. And so I had confidence from her, I had confidence from my parents, um, from my husband at home, who made me feel like I could do it. Mm. And I think that's, poten that's, that's not potentially, I think that is actually what we need from my point of view, is that we need to make people believe that they can do it mm. and believe that it's at least worth trying and yeah. give, you know, give it a shot. So I'd like to see some mentoring, some one-on-one, -on -one, some kind of, some, 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 something more around that where people pay it forward as well, people that have, that have further progressed, that they'd go back and do that and make, make it easy. Encouragement, yeah. 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 yeah, I totally agree with both of you. I was gonna say there's not one thing. I can't <laughs> mention just one thing. Because it goes back to changing the narrative, the media, celebrating women, demystifying the world of entrepreneurship. So one thing that we do is we have a media platform where we um, share female entrepreneurs' stories. So we invite them to come on, whether it's on the podcast or on our blog, and we interview them in a How She Did It series. So we ask them the challenges they faced, you know, how they took their idea through to creation. Did they get um, funding? Did they self-fund um, self the idea? And the different steps that they took, um, mistakes they learned from, things like that. Because I think when you hear from other women who have built businesses, you start to realise that it's more accessible and it's more realistic to think that you can. So I think I think that change in narrative and being able to provide a platform in which women can learn and, and hear from other women um, and community, more community. Yeah. So, and I, as I said, I think it's great the number of communities that are out there at the moment. We just need more of them, yeah. and um, a mentorship scheme would be great. And that's something that we're offering on our new digital platform. A little plug there. Um, <laughs> but you know, you can get paired up with experts who have been there and done it, and might be one or five or ten years ahead, and you can start learning from their um, experiences. So that wasn't one thing, but yeah, lots of things no, to think. Exactly. <laughs> so much food for thought again. So hopefully, we can spread the word and see some of them in action. Yeah, hopefully, no. Well, thank you, panel, for today. Thank you. thank you to everyone for joining in. And again, a special thank you to our panel for joining us. Um, you can stay up to date with everything to do with Startups Magazine at www.startupsmagazine.co.uk. And we hope to see you for the next episode. Bye.